You may have felt like you're an imposter whenever you sit down to run your very first game. But don't worry, you're not. And chances are you're not alone in feeling like that. Let's talk about that today. My name's Joe. Welcome to Tabletop Theory, where we talk about educational theory, counseling theory, and how all of those things put together can help you become a better role player. Today, we're going to talk about something called imposter syndrome and how it actually has a big effect on a lot of people who are trying to become new storytellers or who might be storytellers already, but feel like what they're doing isn't necessarily real. You might have been a storyteller for the last 10, 15 years, but every time you sit down at a table, you feel like somebody's gonna finally call you out as a fraud. Don't worry, this is something that's actually had a lot of research done on it, and there's a really good book called The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, written by Valerie Young. It's not just about women, although it is specifically geared towards women. It's a really valuable insight into the idea of what imposter syndrome actually is, and I wanna talk about it today because it's something that I feel like comes up a lot whenever I'm having discussions with people who want to become game masters. Whenever I hear people say that they've been a game master for a long time, but they don't feel confident in what they're doing, or that want to become game masters and don't necessarily feel like they can because they're going to be found out that they don't actually know anything. Those are pretty normal feelings that people have whenever they get into the role-playing game hobby, and I want to talk about them because we can try to understand it, we can normalize it, and that way we can understand that we're not alone in this feeling, but we can also talk about it in a way that helps provide information to people who might be feeling like they're their imposters and might feel like they don't necessarily know what they know when in reality they've been doing really excellent work for their entire lives or for the entire time that they've been doing role playing and no one's going to find them out because there's nothing to find out. Imposter syndrome is one of those things that is really easy to talk about, but it's not so easy to admit that you might be dealing with it. If you feel like you're an imposter, it comes down to the concept of eventually people are going to see that they've made a mistake and that you have no place in the situation that you're in right now, whether that's in graduate school, college, or at the table being a game master. Imposter syndrome actually doesn't mean that the person who's feeling these things is an imposter. Far from it. It just means that they feel Feel like an imposter and it feels like that they're going to be found out. The person who's dealing with imposter syndrome most of the time is the only one that sees themselves as the imposter and most of the time they're also not doing anything wrong. Their performance oftentimes is actually far above their peers because they feel like they need to work that much harder in order to not be discovered as a fraud. So I want to take a little bit of a sidestep and talk a little bit about some things that are happening in the role-playing game world that I believe are contributing to this growing sense of imposter imposter syndrome. So the recent popularization of role-playing games, probably due to 5th edition over the last several years, also has something to do with Matt Mercer and Critical Role. Now don't worry, I see everybody getting twitchy by their phones and their keyboards. I'm not going to bash Matt Mercer and everybody who's part of Vox Machina, far from it. I think they do good work and they've done a lot of really good things for a lot of people. However, they've done something that's unintentionally a little bit of a disservice to the role-playing game community at large. What they've done is raise the expectation of new players that are coming into role-playing games for the first time. If you've never played a role-playing game, much less actually run a role-playing game, and your only exposure to the RPG hobby is Matt Mercer and his incredible cast of characters and his excellent role-playing, if that's the only exposure to the hobby that you've had, of course you're going to feel intimidated. Of course, if you step into the ring as a game master, you're going to feel like an imposter. The important part about that, about Matt Mercer and all the other people that are out there role-playing on Twitch or YouTube or wherever, they used to be right where you might be right now. If you've never played or you want to get into running a game but you feel like you're not up for it, the people in Critical Role have been playing for a very long time. The only difference being that when they started, they didn't have what you do now, which is a much more readily available example of what quality role-playing games look like. Prior to things like Critical Role, there really wasn't much of a public example of how to play Dungeons and & Dragons, and I really hesitate to say play it the right way, because in my opinion, there's very few wrong ways to play role-playing games. Yeah, there are a few, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. The other thing to keep in mind is that these people, most of them are professional actors or professional voice actors. That's a really high bar to try to think you need to start at. Another analogy would be sports. If you're going to be starting a new sport, you're going to start from zero and expect to train 
train and practice before you get any good. The same thing applies to role-playing games. Whenever you start, you're not going to be as good or as comfortable as you will be 5, 10, 15 months or years down the road. The more you do it, the more comfortable you become at it. It's just like developing any other skill. You're going to be more comfortable with the rules, more comfortable with actually getting into character, and be able to reference things a lot more easily for newer players who got into the hobby after you. The thing to remember is that it's just like sports in that same regard. If you start playing a sport and expect to become a professional that day, it's an unrealistic expectation that really can never happen. You need to take the time to practice in order to actually become comfortable enough to feel confident in your skill level. And yes, this is going to take some time, and yes, you can look at things like Critical Role and get some influence and some inspiration from them, but I really don't think it's a great idea to actually put yourself up against those people and say, I'm going to start at that level, because you really can't. And that's okay. It's okay to be a beginner, and I really wanted to point that out. If you start playing and you feel like you're not up to the level that you expect to be or you want to be, and you're running a game for other people, you might feel like an imposter. Even if you're able to host games and run them on a weekly basis and you have stories to keep telling your players, you might feel like you're just one session away from being called out as a fraud. You might feel like your players are right on the edge of looking at you and saying, you really don't know what you're doing. But chances are, if you're suffering from imposter syndrome, you're the only one who actually has that type of hesitation and fear about your own abilities. In most cases, players who have somebody to play with are just grateful to be there in the first place. And if they have a storyteller who's willing to put themselves out there every week to continue telling stories, the players are going to appreciate the effort that you're putting forward to actually run games for them. But I don't want to make anybody feel like they're secretly good at what they're doing because you're an imposter, right? No. If you're running games for people, you're a storyteller. That's really the only qualification for it. And in fact, I've actually talked about this in another video, and I believe what I said was you should be prepared to be unprepared. As long as you are comfortable with the idea that at some point during that game, you're probably not going to know what happens next, you won't be as surprised when it happens. Okay, that's not exactly how I remembered it. The thing I wanted you to remember is to be prepared to be unprepared, but sometimes that feeling of unpreparedness can move past just a feeling and into an overwhelming thing like imposter syndrome. In her book and on her website, which I'll leave links down in the description, Valerie Young talks about different sort of categorizations of people that might be suffering from imposter syndrome. I wanted to talk a little bit about those and maybe you, you might feel like you fit in to one of these categorizations, and I also want to talk a little bit about how you can overcome some of the difficulties that come from maybe fitting into one of those categories. So there's five different categories that Dr. Young talks about in her book that I want to go over and sort of describe to give you an idea of not only what they are, but how they relate to role playing and how you can kind of overcome them. The first is the perfectionist. Now, the perfectionist is somebody who feels like whenever they're doing a project, like running a role playing game group, everything needs to be 100% perfect. And if everything is 99% perfect and there's still one flaw, you're going to find yourself focusing on that one flaw as an example of why you're a fraud. The perfectionist won't accept anything less than complete perfection. Anything less than perfection is exactly the type of evidence that the perfectionist needs to feel like they are an imposter and they're just one mistake away from being exposed. I've really seen this a lot with new game masters, the idea that everything needs to be perfect, thought out, developed, and put together exactly right before they can ever bring their story to light for a group of players. For me at least, I've never really been 100% prepared to run a game, but at the same time I know a lot of other people who also have been running games for a number of years that have never really run what they would consider to be a perfect game because something's always going to go a way that you don't expect, but a lot of that also comes down to the idea of how you qualify perfection. If it's something that you feel like you can actually point to and say, this is perfection, this is exactly what I'm talking about, I know exactly what a perfect game looks like, then maybe you have a clear idea of what success looks like. But chances are, if you're one of the people that actually tries to find reasons why you've made mistakes to feel like you're going to be exposed as a fraud and you're a 
perfectionist, you've probably got a moving goalpost as far as the idea of what success actually is. Lots of people have told me that they don't want to run a game because they feel like everything that they are gonna put together is going to be boring or it's not gonna be intriguing enough for the players that actually want to come and play. And on the rare occasion that somebody like a perfectionist actually does get to the point of running a game, I hear back from them that the game was a complete failure because the players didn't pick up on the one plot point that they threw out there, but they did pick up on a number of other plot points. The thing to keep in mind is that perfection is unattainable in a lot of things and being a storyteller is definitely one of them. And like I said before, the idea of being prepared to be unprepared is so important because the moment you realize that your players are going to do things that you don't expect is the moment you're actually going to feel relief from the pressure of wanting to be perfect and feeling like a fraud if you're not. The next categorization of somebody who might be suffering from imposter syndrome is the idea of the expert. Now, the expert is kind of like the knowledge version of the perfectionist. The expert has to feel like they know every single thing about all of the different facets of what they're working on. And in the context of role-playing games, this particular GM, the expert, might feel like they need to have every single piece of information memorized at their disposal and referenceable correctly before they're prepared to actually run a game. And if they do run a game and they don't remember everything perfectly, that feeling of acting like a fraud comes in and that fear of being exposed as a fraud starts to become a lot more present in the back of your mind. The thing to remember about being an expert is that it's really okay if you don't know everything. The idea of true expertise in some settings that I've heard is described as knowing that you don't know everything but still being open to new information. I've been playing for a very long time and I will be the first to admit that I don't remember all the rules. I'm not an expert in all of the rules for all the settings. But I do consider myself to be an expert in storytelling because I've been doing it for so long and I've started to see patterns emerge from players and themes and stories and different types of pre-planned adventures or worlds that I've run. But I understand that I'm going to make mistakes because I'm not going to know all the information. Nobody's a computer and it's kind of unfair to hold yourself to the sort of standard of knowing everything because it's pretty impossible. I've been playing since 1992 and I still look stuff up. The other thing to keep in mind is that memorization doesn't make you a good GM. It just means that you have a good memory. And if you want to memorize things, that's okay. But if you don't know everything, it doesn't mean that you're going to be exposed as a fraud. It just means that you have the same type of memory limitations that most people do. It's okay to look things up and it's okay to admit that you need help. Help. And honestly, whenever I've seen people that suffer from this kind of frustration that they don't have all the information, one of the things that I've found to be helpful is to sort of delegate that type of rule reference or any kind of mid-game sort of confusion around a rule from the GM to a player. If you have an interaction occurring between two characters and there's a third player who may not necessarily be as involved and there's a dispute about a rule, what I try to do is actually ask that third player, hey, while we're dealing with this, can you look that rule up for me so that we can actually have a ruling on that, but I can keep the game going. It's a way that referencing rules can still be carried out, but you don't necessarily have to feel like you're going to be called out as a non-expert because your attention is going to be focused on running the game instead of looking up rules. The next type of categorization of people that might be suffering from imposter syndrome is the idea of the soloist. Soloists feel like they need to do everything and figure everything out on their own because if they don't, then chances are they feel like they're an imposter. They feel like they're going to be called out again as a fraud because they didn't do everything by themselves themselves. For soloists, it can be really tough to ask for help or even realize that they need it. It might feel like publicly asking for any kind of assistance is sort of admitting the fact that they're not who the people that they're working with actually think that they are. Accepting help can be really hard, and I know this because actually I identify the most with the whole idea of the soloist. I feel like if I don't do all the work myself, then I'm going to be called out as a fraud. But the thing I always have to remind myself about being a soloist, but 
but also being a storyteller, is that role-playing games are a collaborative storytelling process. I really can't be a storyteller by myself. I need players in order to actually tell the story. If I don't have them, then what am I? I might just be a person talking to myself in a room rolling dice, which could sound like fun. I know there are solo RPGs out there, but at the same time, for me, being a storyteller means having other players at the table with me. And as soon as I can admit that I actually need the other players there in order to have a fulfilling experience, then I can actually start to feel more comfortable with the idea that sharing some of the load of that work isn't just on me, it's on the other players. And as I've sort of come to understand that over the years, it's started to become something that I'm more comfortable with. And yeah, occasionally I still feel a little bit clenched up either whenever I'm playing games or whenever I'm working, if I have to ask somebody for help. but. You need to understand, and I say you when I really mean me, I need to have a better understanding of the idea that asking for help doesn't mean that I'm weak. It just means that I need some help. So the next categorization is the idea of the natural genius. The natural genius doesn't necessarily always focus on the idea of perfection or having all the information readily available or doing all the work themselves. They focus on the idea of how easy it looks. The natural genius, as a person who's dealing with imposter syndrome, feels like they need to look effortless as they work. Now, from a storytelling perspective, this could mean that you feel like you need to make everything look seamless and easy. And there's a lot of examples out there of people who do that on a regular basis using things like Twitch or YouTube, and Matt Mercer's a really good example of that, as well as lots of other role-playing game people that are on Twitch. You don't necessarily see all the things that go on in the background. Lots of people that do that kind of work online have teams of writers, they have production staff, they have lots of other people at their disposal that their entire job is to make the point person look like they're doing everything as easily and effortlessly as possible. For somebody like the natural genius, that type of ease and effortlessness is essential because at the first sign of any type of struggle, they might feel like everybody's finally gonna realize what's wrong with them and that they don't belong. It's the idea that if you need to ask for any kind of help or you need to show that you're struggling with something, then that immediately shows weakness and you're gonna be called out. You're gonna be shown as a fraud. But again, it's that type of understanding of where that fear comes from that can lead us to sort of start to deal with it. The thing to remember about storytelling is that it's messy and players are unpredictable. And if people start throwing curveballs at you, and they will, you're going to take a minute sometimes to actually collect your thoughts and try to figure out what happens next. I do it all the time and a lot of good storytellers do. Because the fun thing about role-playing games is that players are going to do things that you don't expect. It's gonna take time to learn how to become a good game master, and realistically, the only way to use that time is to make mistakes, but also to learn from those mistakes. Mistakes might feel like a sign of weakness, but honestly, they're just an opportunity for growth in disguise. And sometimes mistakes might make us feel embarrassed or feel like a fraud, but they're an essential part of the learning process that everybody really goes through. But when it starts to become part of the imposter syndrome for a natural genius, it's actually taking the time to judge yourself for making those mistakes, taking the time to recognize when you're actually judging yourself gives you an opportunity to sort of pump the brakes and realize what you're doing before you actually start to judge yourself and you can sort of back off those feelings of feeling like a fraud when you start to realize that that judgment is only coming from you, not the people around you. So the last categorization is the superhuman. Dr. Young calls it the superwoman, but you know, we're trying to be gender neutral here, so I'm gonna call it the superhuman. The superhuman is the person who feels like they don't just need to do everything, but they need to be the best at doing everything. And if they see themselves as not being the best as the storyteller, the role player, the referencer, the person who has all the information, and the person that makes it look effortless, then they're a fraud. They feel like that if they're not at the tippy top of the class or the very best that's ever been, then they're not not worth anybody's time or they're going to be discovered as a complete imposter. And I can tell you, nothing is further from the truth. It's normal to want to be the best storyteller your players have ever had. 
You might want to buy all the books, get all the food, host the games, write all the stories, do all the best voices. If you're not doing everything to the very best level, then you feel like you're not necessarily living up to your end of the bargain. Because when one of those things might fall through or doesn't necessarily go your way, it starts to sort of create that little snowball effect of imposter syndrome and the eventual discovery of everybody else around you. Ah, this person's not a superhero, they must be a fraud. That's a really tough feeling for somebody who might feel like they need to do everything in order to fit in. Realizing that other people helping or contributing or other players helping or contributing can be a good thing is a tough lesson to learn for somebody who feels like they need to do everything themselves, similar to the soloist, but instead of just doing everything yourself, the superhero needs to do everything themselves, but they also need to do it the best. Getting the information down from the people that you're working with and being open to that type of constructive criticism is a really hard thing to do, not just for the superhero, but also for anybody who deals with imposter syndrome. Trying to accept that level of help, or any help, is a really scary thing because it requires you to be vulnerable. That type of vulnerability is a really scary place for a lot of people, and myself included. Trying to feel like you don't have everything completely dialed in is really, really scary, and it can help add to that sort of overwhelming feeling that it's just in a certain amount of time before you get discovered, found out, and cast out. And just like the soloist, I want to encourage people that feel like they're superheroes to remember that RPGs are a collaborative storytelling process. You really can't do it by yourself. You have to have the other players there with you in order to help tell a story that everybody gets to enjoy. And remember, if people offer to help, it doesn't mean that they think you can't do it. It just means that they want to be a part of the process as well. Imposter syndrome is a real thing, and if you feel like any of these categories apply to you, I want to be clear. Nothing's wrong with you. People have these feelings about inadequacy and insecurity all the time. And it just happens that Dr. Young took the opportunity to write a book about it. And there's lots of other really good books about it too. The fact that you're watching this video right now proves to the fact that you actually feel like there's a way that you can move through this to start to deal with the idea of imposter syndrome, not to overcome it or get past it or fix it because that's kind of the wrong way to describe it. If you're dealing with imposter syndrome, there's not a light switch you can flick to make it go away. It's a lot like learning a skill. It's something that you're gonna to have to learn about over a period of time. And it's encouraging the fact that you're here right right now learning about it because that tells me, and more importantly, it tells you that you're trying to get some information to get some help for yourself. It shows that you want to learn how to become a better game master. So much of the imposter syndrome I've found is wrapped up around the idea of success. The idea of qualifying success in a number of different ways, whether it's you need to look effortless in your success, you have to be doing it completely by yourself, you need to be the best at it. But the thing is, trying to understand what you define as success is very important to helping to understand how to overcome imposter syndrome. Because oftentimes when you find success, it gets blown off. It's something that, oh yeah, I graduated from college. Oh yeah, I just ran a really good game. Oh yeah, my players had a really good time. But you don't take the time to understand and appreciate what has occurred. You don't take the time, or at least I don't take the time, as somebody who deals with imposter syndrome, to understand what I feel like success is before I actually set out to accomplish a goal. And the dangerous thing about that is that if you don't really know what success will look like, you don't know when you get there, which means that it continues to move further and further away. For things like being a GM, it can be a little nebulous, but for things like sports, it's actually really easy to define a success. If you're Amanda Nunes and you beat your opponent, then congratulations, you've won the match. That's a success. If you're a GM and you don't know how to define success, here's a couple of ways that I would recommend doing it. You got through the game and all of your players are there and they had a good time. You played a game and you felt like you actually enjoyed yourself. I'd call that a success. You ran a game for other players and somebody else told you that they had a good time. That's a success. You offered to run a game and all of your players showed up on time. That's a success. Take some time to do a little self-reflection and try to figure out what it is that you define as success that you can use as a benchmark for yourself in the future. There's not an instant fix for imposter syndrome or anxiety, but there is something that's helped me over the years and I hope it helps you. It's the knowledge that everybody starts somewhere. I started at zero, Matt Mercer and his entire crew started at zero, and you started at zero. 
But chances are, if you've actually made it through this entire video, you're not at zero anymore. You're building information, you're building knowledge, and you're building confidence to create the worlds and stories for your players that you want to. And that's the important part. Because even though you might feel uncomfortable right now with the idea of being vulnerable enough to share your stories, if you trust yourself enough and you trust your players enough, you're going to be rewarded with the experience of actually getting your ideas out there for other people to appreciate. So that's all I've got. Thank you so much for watching everybody. I know that it's sort of an involved one that we talked a lot more about mental health than gaming, but at the same time, I really did want to actually bring these ideas forward because I think they're important. And I'm really glad that you took the time to watch this video. So I appreciate it. If you feel like I missed something or that you want to leave in the comment section down here, please do. You can also follow me on Instagram or Twitter or if you like this video enough you can even hit the subscribe button. I appreciate it and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Mr. Rogers, a personal hero of mine, has a really great quote that I feel like applies pretty well to what we've talked about today. The most important learning is to accept and expect mistakes and deal with the disappointments that they bring. The things about mistakes are that they make us who we are. Nobody's perfect because if we were, we wouldn't learn anything and we wouldn't grow as people. And I don't know about you, but I enjoy the fact that I've matured and grown over my life and I really don't wanna be who I was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago. I've grown because I've learned. And part of that learning came from mistakes. The act of making mistakes is inevitable and that's okay. It's part of what makes us human. Nobody is perfect and that's also okay because the pursuit of perfection can drive us crazy. So many of us feel like we need to be perfect all the time and that's unfortunate, but it's also not true. Mistakes are what make us human. It's our differences and our diversity between each other that make us unique and wonderful to be around. There's so much about being yourself that is important to accept and love because you're fine the way you are. The way you look is fine, the way you talk is fine, the way you love is fine. This video isn't going to cure you of imposter syndrome, but that's important because it doesn't matter if there's a cure. Trying to understand what imposter syndrome is really is a journey, and trying to figure out how you can feel comfortable in your own skin isn't something that's going to happen overnight. But understanding the fact that you can make mistakes and that's not a bad thing is a valuable step on that journey. Because remember, the most important learning is that we accept and expect mistakes and deal with the disappointments that they bring. Thank you so much for watching. Take care, be kind, and have fun adventuring.